Good morning and uh, welcome to, to the Bank of Spain. Uh, we are uh, absolutely delighted to host uh, this exciting conference on, on aging. Uh, a warm uh, welcome to the speakers that have come to, to Madrid and, uh, of course, to all uh, participants. This conference is part of the Georgetown University Global Economic Challenges Network, which uh, sponsors a series of international workshops that bring together leading scholars and policymakers to discuss some of the most important economic problems of our time. Before uh, starting with my uh, introductory remarks, uh, let me uh, thank the organizers, a special thanks to Professor Francis Bella. Francis Bella is a special advisor to the President for International Engagement uh, at Georgetown University uh, for making this conference uh, a reality, and of course uh, to Olympia Bober at the Bank of Spain, Manuel Arellano and Rafa Repullo at CENFI for the impressive program they have put uh, together. The motivation of the conference is uh, rather obvious. A major demographic change is in motion, one that will only accelerate as the 21st century progresses. The baby boom from the 50s to 70s, the fall in fertility starting in the 70s, and a steadily rising longevity are set to dramatically change the size and uh, age composition of the population and the labor force uh, alike. This demographic change is global, affecting developed countries to a greater extent, but less developed countries uh, too. Uh, just to give one number, according to United Nations forecast, the world population is expected to, to, to peak at uh, 10.4 billion by the end of this uh, century as a result of all these uh, changes. To illustrate uh, it with a bit more of detail, um, let me give also some numbers for the Spanish economy. Spain is indeed one of the countries where the demographic change will be felt most acutely. We enjoy one of the longest life expectancies uh, at birth, currently over 80 years for men and over 85 for women, and suffer from one of the lowest fertility rates, 1.2. The Spanish population is still increasing, but only because of immigration flows which rebounded after the pandemic, after the COVID-19 crisis. According to projections, forecasts uh, from the Spanish Statistical Office, only on the very optimistic assumptions regarding the recovery of fertility rates and immigrant arrivals, good uh, the working age population not decline but hold at around the current level of 32 million in the coming decades. As a result, under this, uh, again, I stress optimistic demographic forecast, the ratio of the population aged 70 years or more to the working age population would increase by 20 percentage points in the next 25 years, from 24 percent to 43 percent. And in addition, the average age of the working age population, currently at 43.7 years, will remain well above 44 years during the period 2035-2072, and, perhaps even more important, the average age of employees is expected to rise even more sharply as the employment rate of older workers has uh, more scope to increase and is expected to rise more rapidly than that of their middle-aged uh, counterparts. Such a big uh, demographic uh, change could uh, cause, uh, will cause, uh, profound economic implications. Attention is largely focused on understanding uh, how social protection policies, which currently are mostly uh, financed through intergenerational transfers in most countries, will need to be adapted, but it can have far broader macroeconomic consequences, including on inequality, which will be uh, the subject of session one uh, after these introductory remarks. In what uh, follows, I will only sketch some of these economic implications of demographic uh, change uh, as a kind of uh, introduction to the conference. But let me emphasize from the start that together with the impact of uh, climate change, with the impact of uh, technological uh, change, they are likely to, to represent the biggest challenge facing economic and social policies in the coming uh, decades. I will structure my remarks around uh, four uh, main points. First, how aggregate demand and its sexual composition is likely to change with population aging. Second, how aging of the working age population affects the supply side of the economy, in particular the functioning of the labor market and productivity growth. Third, how social policies will be affected. Fourth, uh, why and how monetary and fiscal policies will also be affected by demographic change. 
And as uh, you uh, will see in my comments, I will raise more questions uh, than answers, uh, as further research is clearly needed to understand the very profound implications of demographic change. By the way, most of uh, the comments uh, I will be making today are part of uh, an special issues chapter that uh, was published in our annual report in 2018, a chapter that was coordinated by Juan Francisco Jimeno. Of course, uh, he's here, one of our uh, major experts on this uh, field. Starting um, with uh, the connection uh, between population aging and aggregate demand, uh, we should uh, start uh, again from the obvious, uh, saying, of course, that a typical household uh, consumption, savings, and financial position change over the life uh, cycle. Saving is highest uh, during middle age to repay the debts we typically take on in our younger years, and, of course, also to build up savings for retirement. By contrast, when we are older, we consume the wealth that we have built up, providing that the bequest motive is not too strong. Additional uh, international intergenerational transfers of wealth are also affected by increases in longevity, and who receive bequests and at what point in their life cycle also has consequences uh, for aggregate consumption, saving profiles, and the financial position of households. Thus, uh, population aging is expected uh, to trigger substantial changes in household saving patterns and wealth uh, portfolios. In particular, for uh, the life cycle uh, reasons I've just uh, described, the larger the relative size of the older population, the higher the average propensity to consume and the lower the savings uh, rate. Thus, uh, the composition, the so-called composition effect of population aging would by itself mean a lower savings rate in the longer term, although aggregate saving will tend to increase during the transition towards an older society due to expectations of higher future consumption needs in the future. One caveat here I think is uh, very important. Future cohorts will not necessarily repeat the consumer and saving patterns of previous generations and the uncertainty over how long uh, we will live may prompt the older population to reduce uh, its saving rate to a lesser degree than did previous generations. Also, following a period of plummeting infertility and high uncertainty about the amount of their pension income and their longevity, households may possibly be less inclined to transfer their wealth in the form of bequest. If so, the demand for financial instruments that could extract lifelong income flows from the uh, illiquid assets during retirement could uh, increase. And of course, there might be heterogeneity, and heterogeneity in particular across uh, countries, uh, that may condition the magnitude, even the size, uh, the sign, sorry, of these effects. In the Spanish case, for example, two characteristics uh, stand out. One is that inheritance are relatively large compared with other countries. And the second is that a large fraction, fraction of the wealth built up for retirement is in the form of residential property, which is a rather illiquid form of wealth, while retirement savings held in pension funds are among the lowest in the OECD economies. As a result, the disposable income and consumption of the older Spanish population tends to depend crucially on the generosity of public uh, pensions, an issue uh, that I will come back uh, later. This is about uh, uh, savings. Uh, as for investment, some factors suggest that it is also likely to decline as the relative weight of the older population increases. A smaller working age population will require less capital, which conceivably is now cheaper to accumulate uh, thanks to the current technological developments that are significantly decreasing the relative price of capital, even beyond the secular declining trend that was already underway. Other factors, such as the transition to a green economy and greater automation is in response to lower labor supply, suggest that investment may need to increase, which, of course, uh, is not obvious uh, which of these opposing uh, factors or forces will prevail uh, and uh, remains uh, clearly an open question. What seems less controversial is that residential investment is likely to decline with a smaller young population and also given the strong accumulation of residential dwellings during the first decade of this century. And needless to say, changes in savings and in investment would have implications for international capital flows, as capital tends to flow towards countries with relatively younger populations, higher productivity growth and a stronger return on capital. Consequently, there will be capital outflows from and current 
current account surpluses in countries where the population is aging more quickly, which in principle will be those experiencing faster and sharper decreases in the return on capital and in productivity. Second topic, which is uh, the connection between population aging and aggregate supply, again an issue that will be discussed uh, in this conference under session uh, three and four. Um, let me start by, by saying that, of course, again, demographic changes can impact the potential growth of an economy through several channels, mainly through uh, potential employment, but also through productivity. First, as lower working age population growth results in lower employment growth, provided the participation rate does not increase and the unemployment rate does not decrease. In addition, given that participation and employment rates vary substantially across age groups, any change in the age distribution of the population will affect the aggregate employment rate. In particular, older workers typically have lower participation and employment rates than their middle-aged counterparts, mainly because they are more likely to suffer from health issues and long-term unemployment. Thus, as the relative weight of older workers increases, the aggregate participation and employment rates tend to decline. In the case of Spain, uh, again to illustrate this point, this composition effect is projected to cause a fall in the aggregate participation rate of around four percentage points over the rest of the decade. Over the same period, based on plausible scenarios for immigration, the aggregate employment rate is expected to fall by more than two percentage points, which are, of course, numbers that are clearly material, that are uh, of sufficient size as to be uh, worried. Second, aging can also have a significant impact on productivity. On the one hand, the professional experience of older workers and the higher educational attainments of younger cohorts are both good for productivity. On the other hand, older workers are less mobile and thus less likely to relocate in search of new job opportunities. Moreover, innovation is a kind of job food pursuit at which young workers are more likely to succeed. But success in innovation also requires the knowledge and experience built up by the previous generation. In other words, as far as innovation and productivity enhancing activities are concerned, young and older workers can complement each other. And many of these mechanisms by which demographics uh, affect productivity are well documented in the research, and there, should be, there seems to be a consensus that overall population aging entails lower productivity. So avoiding uh, such a gloomy scenario of lower employment, lower productivity, will require an optimal allocation of the talent available across the different generations in order to exploit the potential synergies between workers of different ages. And this will be a major challenge, uh, however, especially in a context of rapid global and disrupted uh, technological change, such as the one we are currently witnessing. Labor market institutions and the education uh, system, of course, will no doubt have to adapt substantially to contend with this demographic uh, challenge. So let's now move uh, to social policies in the context of an aging society, which uh, again, this will be the topic uh, of section uh, two uh, in uh, today's conference. Uh, as the retired population grows, and if benefits per capita remain constant, transfers through the public pension system will increase. Moreover, the lower the working age population as a proportion of the total population, the lower, in relative terms, the revenue from the social security contributions used to fund contributory social benefits. In addition, as the population ages, the demand for public health and long-term care uh, increases. Again, let me give you some numbers that uh, try to illustrate this point for the Spanish economy. Uh, according to our independent uh, fiscal authority, total pension expenditure is projected to increase from around 13% of GDP today to 16.2% by 2050. The increase in health expenditure is also expected to be considerable, rising by nearly 1.5 percentage points the next three decades according to projections in the European Commission's late, latest aging uh, report. Over the last decade, the pension system uh, in Spain and in many other countries has undergone a number of reforms, mainly uh, aimed at increasing the effective retirement age, shoring up social security revenues, and introducing automatic adjustment mechanisms. Of course, we know that estimating the impact that the various measures approved may have on the system's revenue and expenditure over the coming decades is subject uh, to much uncertainty, 
But in any event, the wide range of estimates available, including those produced by the Bank of Spain, but also, of course, by other institutions, suggest that as a result of the various legislative changes approved since 2021, the Spanish pension system will, in the longer term, have to assume greater expenditure obligations that will not be fully offset by the revenues raised. A further uncertainty is, of course, the potential adverse impact of higher social security contributions on employment, wages, and competitiveness. Uh, therefore, according to these estimates, further measures uh, will have to be adopted to shore up the system's financial sustainability. And of course, in any event, given the importance, the magnitude of all the reforms that have been approved, a transparent, ongoing, and thorough assessment of the effects of this reform is absolutely needed, including uh, for sure, their impact or uh, intergenerational equity. So let uh, me uh, move uh, to uh, the final point, which is the connection uh, between macro policies and demographics. And here the main point is that the effectiveness of macroeconomic stabilization policies is also likely to be affected by demographic changes. First, aging matters for a crucial variable for monetary policy, the so-called natural rate uh, of interest the theoretical rate consistent with full employment and hence that would prevail in equilibrium under price stability and a zero output gap. Insofar as older population leads to higher savings and lower investment, population aging will continue to lower the natural rate. Second, population aging also has an impact on the relative price of goods versus services as well as on uh, wages. An older population demands relatively more services whose, whose prices increase more slowly. Also, in relative terms, older people typically display more anti-inflationary behavior as they have accumulated more wealth and are therefore generally net creditors. Meanwhile, wage profiles tend to flatten out at later stages of a working life, which by virtue uh, of the composition effect, again, is likely to create less wage pressure. However, the empirical evidence on the demographic determinants of both price and wage inflation is inconclusive and, uh, again, as more empirical research is needed on the theoretical mechanisms described above. This is uh, uh, about monetary. If we move to fiscal, uh, population aging is also likely to change the size and the composition of fiscal revenue and expenditure. I was already mentioned some of the channels. In terms of revenue, a downward trend in the size of working age populations and in the labor participation is likely to reduce the weight of social security contributions and income taxes. Moreover, since the older population tends to consume more goods and services that are subject to lower consumption rates due mainly to subsidies and the VAT exemption on publicly provided services, population aging is also likely to lower the effective aggregate tax rate. As for expenditures, higher demand for social policies places extraordinary pressure on public budgets, mostly, but not only, in the form of pension and health programs, as I have already uh, mentioned. Another interesting uh, fiscal effect of aging is uh, through fiscal multipliers. And here the point is mainly that how much GDP growth uh, as a result of a variation, a discretionary variation in public revenues or expenditure depends crucially on, of course, uh, marginal proportionality to consume, also on uh, labor supply elasticities, which we know they vary by age uh, group. And here, research by Bank of, uh, Bank of Spain staff shows that government spending multipliers depend, therefore, on the population age, uh, age structure. And according to this evidence, the estimated local fiscal multiplier is 1.5 on average, but increases with the population share of young people in project multipliers of 1.1, 1.9 in the interquantile uh, range. And if we move to the, to the US, the evidence that we have for the US is that the, the, the aging of the US population between 1980 and uh, 2015 is estimated to have caused uh, a decline of around 38% in national government spending multipliers, an effect that is likely to continue as population aging gathers uh, space. And of course, the main conclusion from all this evidence is that the stabilization capacity of both monetary policy and fiscal policy uh, will be greatly affected by population aging. So, to conclude, uh, we know that demographic changes are going to have deep and wide economic and social consequences. We know some of the main mechanisms that may trigger these uh, consequences. And yet, we do not know how to precisely quantify these effects, nor do we know the policy alternatives best suited to facing the major demographic challenges to lie ahead. But, of course, I'm completely certain that this conference will provide 
many answers and also food for thought in this regard. So thank you very much for your attention. Well, welcome everybody, and thank, uh, uh, thanks to the governor for making these more substantive comments, because I'm only going to make comments of a, of a more mundane nature, but nevertheless important ones. First of all, yeah, I'd like to um, I bring uh, apologies from President DeJoya from Georgetown, who um, I guess many of you would have been very surprised to have seen that he was on the program, because it's typically not the one of the functions of the university president to attend events, economics conferences. Um, but I think that reflected just the level of interest that he has uh, in this endeavor, this, this, the, the Global Georgetown Economics um, Challenge Network. Um, so this event is, one of, uh, is part of that series. Um, and uh, the, the objective, as was pointed out by the governor just a moment ago, is to sort of to combine um, leading researchers with policymakers with the idea of addressing important economic problems. And I think, you know, uh, this conference um, is like a perfect example of that. I mean, if you, the, I mean it's really an astounding, an astounding program, obviously addressing a, a very, very important, a very, very important topic. Um, so, look, all I would like to do is just uh, take a few moments just to thank people. First of all, I'd, I'm very grateful to all the participants who have, have come, um, many of you from, long, from, from far away. Um, uh, now that I'm sure that you're here, you can see the venue, you're very pleased that you, that you came. Um, but first of all, I would, li I would like to, to, to thank them. Secondly, um, I'd like to thank our hosts, um, the Bank of Spain and SEMFI. Um, you know, I can say, I, I remember when we met, uh, I met with Olympia and Manuel three or four years ago. When we, when we were going to start this network, and one of the first places I contacted to try to convince them to be part of the network was uh, Olympia and, uh, and Manuel. You know, I can still remember how excited I was when they said that they, they were interested. You know, the, the Bank of Spain with all its history, um, and uh, SEMFI, which to me personally is an extraordinary place, given my own interests are in econometrics, Though um, Manuel looks like he's young enough to be my son, Manuel, of course, is a slightly ahead of me in the chronologically, um, but he's uh, an iconic figure in econometrics, and to my own interests, you know, is uh, sort of takes on a, the, a somewhat of a heroic uh, character. I should also say that Manuel knows this: that um, my my most frequent co-author is Ivan Fernandez Val, who was a student from Semfi. So Semfi is a very, very special place to me. So to be here today is really a tremendous honor and, uh, and uh, really a very exciting thing for me. Um, also, if I can just say that I think the person who deserves the greatest amount of, of, of credit is Olympia. Olympia, I can't see me have put it together, such a remarkable program um, that I'm, I'm embarrassed to take any sort of uh, any sort of uh, acknowledgement of it right for, on my own behalf, because I really haven't done anything. But really, I, if I can just say, ask, I know it's, it's sort of very early in the proceedings, but to, to thank people, but if, yeah, I mean, you really deserve a, a hand, of, a round of applause. So if people could be, um, help me there. So it's really uh, a, a remarkable thing. And um, so thank you for all the work you've done. Um, and. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, the only person that I'm aware of that I saw email messages from was, was Beatrice. Well, I'll thank her as well, even though I'm not, not pronouncing her name correctly, I'm sure. But, uh, um, and apart from that, I'm with the show. Right, thank you. <laughs>